Hello and welcome to this small additional exercise of <coughs> session here where I will, as promised, just show you some examples on how to use R um, for doing various things that hopefully will be useful. So swapping over to our studio, which is my preferred, the first thing to do is, at least for this tutorial, just to remove everything that is in the present working directory. Um, so I don't have anything stored in memory and can go from there. Then I'll just change the paths where I want to be. I have some data that I want to read. And the read table here, I can just use a default separator, but you might want to add comma sep equals to whatever you have in the particular file that you're reading. You can also use a function and to import the thing by in a GUI way. But I prefer to generally always write the code that does what you need because then you can reproduce it. So plotting, just a simple plot, can be made in many ways. <clears throat> so setting that I want one row and one column of plots, and I'll just show you the data. Um, what I typically like is to trim the white space around the plot. So I will change the parameters for the margin. Or MPP equals, this is how much space there is, how many lines is the legend or the label away from the axis. Second argument is how far is the numbers away from the axis. Default is tree one and then zero for where the ticks are placed. So I will move them a little bit closer. 0, 2 and 0 0.7 and 0. If I do like this and update the plot, you can see that in, the only thing that changed was that I moved things a little bit closer. And now I will also trim the outer margin. And I think this is 1. So it's giving at the lower left, top, and right how many lines of space are there. Now, we are efficiently using pretty much the space, um, <coughs> which at least I like. You can also say, well, what is the time here? You can make it nicer um, in various ways. But for now, this is just what we want. What we are asked to do, say, is to fit a linear model to the data, or fit a model, and if you look at it, well, a linear model would be a good place to start. I will use the formula notation for the lm function and fit the model here. If now it, I just have to remark this and run it to um, actually show what was the result. If I want to see the result as I make it, I can set a set of parentheses around the whole thing and then I will actually also see the result. But typically for a linear model, what we care about is not, you can say, just the coefficients, but it's actually a summary of what we got. And we see that both the intercept and the slope are significant. And I want to just add a line with a color and line width representing our fit. So. This is uh, the easy way of doing things. If we look at the model object that we fitted, we have the coefficients that we saw previously, we have some residuals, we have a lot of other things in here, also the fitted values and the degrees of freedom for the residuals. So we can see that all these are used to produce the output up here. If we want to kind of compare, we could say, well, if you take the residuals, take the sum of those square and divide it by the length of the data, minus two, because we divide, we estimated two parameters, then we get 1.06. And if you compare that number with the number that we got from the default, it's the same, except that there are more significant different uh, digits second time here. Or we could also have used 
this as uh, to divide with instead of doing it ourselves. Now, the alternative is to kind of do the manual fit where we first make a matrix with a column of ones by combining it with the time that we have. And just looking at the first six lines, well, we have what we want. Now, usually I say x transpose x inverse and pre-multiply that on x transpose and then y. It's numerically, rather than doing that, it's more stable to solve the normal equation as x transpose x and then on the right hand side to have x transpose y. I get the theta here and if I compare with the coefficients from before, well, those are the same values. Now, what we might want to do is to make a prediction, say 50 steps ahead in time, and we want to make a prediction. So let's create a vector of 50 elements. For each prediction, what we want to do is to, at first, we'll calculate what is the, you can see, the prediction interval, how much to add. And there we need to look up in the T distribution, the 97.5% quantile with 498 degrees of freedom. Here we might as well use the normal distribution. We had our sigma hat from previously. And then we take 1 plus x times the inverse of x transpose x, and then also the predictor x out here, as we've seen. If we run this loop, this is doing it the manual way. This does not include the actual predictions, but now let's make a data frame where we have the x hat being the first coefficient, as in the intercept, plus the second coefficient times the actual values that we're using. And then we can have, say, the lower bound. We can add a column to the data frame by specifying it's the x hat minus the prediction interval part that we need to add. And then if we look at it, we have, well, the predicted value and then lower and upper. Now I'll make a plot to show this. It's basically the same plot as before, except that I just made some more space out there to show the prediction. And I use the formula way of doing the plot as well, which generally gives nicer X labels and Y labels by default, but otherwise the same as what was done previously. Then I will add a line with the fitted values now in black, and then I will show the x hat at that, and then I will show the prediction interval like this. This was the, you can say, the default, just keep it coming slowly way of doing things. A more efficient way of doing the same thing would be to use, make a data frame first containing the values you wanna use for prediction and then you use the predict function and the LM model product we want to use. And I want to have a prediction interval. And I use the just create a data frame up here to predict. This gives us exactly the same as what we had up here. So that is a more efficient way. Now for plotting, to redo the same plot, if I start from scratch, that's the same thing as before. And then I add lines for the fitted value as before. But then since I have the predictions as a data frame, I can do a matrix lines rather than doing each line one at a time. Then I will add them and say that they have different line types like this. So if we go back to the previous plot, you can see that it's essentially the same plot. If we want to say, what is the confidence interval for the line? 
Well, I just say that instead of having a prediction interval, I'll make a confidence interval. And I add those as well. And now the question is, are we actually done with what we want to be doing? No, because we just made a model, make predictions, which we should actually not have done. We should have started by doing some validation. So one step in that is looking at the residuals. And just to make it a little bit more clear what I want to look at, I will actually make that a little bit wider, that line. You can see that, well, it looks reasonably OK. There may be a little bit too many points up here and too few down there, but not too bad. Could have been better, but could have been worse. Here I again set the parameters for the markings, as I usually do, to show for the residuals how do they behave. We could look at the histogram of the residuals. And we'll make it in many bins here. And if I then add the density of the normal distribution with the observed sigma hat, it looks like this. Not too bad, I would say. It's, I mean, you can say there's a few lacking there, but then there are some extras here and there, so it's not bad. We can also do a formal test using the Kolmogorov Smirnov test for normality. It's actually too powerful for many purposes, but here we actually get a p-value that is not significant, so we cannot reject that the data are actually normally distributed. Another way would be to look at the cumulative distribution function for the empirical of the data. It looks like this. So you have the, from the data, just sort it, and then each time you have a new observation, you step up one level. And I can again add the expected curve, and it looks fairly OK. If I do the QQ plot, there are two things you can do. The QQ norm is basically just showing the plot, but it's quite difficult to see what's actually going on here. So if I add a QQ line using the quantile, some quantiles in the data, which is the default, I get this line. And you can say, well, there's a small tail down here, but it's not anything major. I could also use add a line where I use the estimated sigma. And you can see that they are not identical, but almost the same. But just to say that they are actually different. For practical purposes, there's no difference in this case. But in case you have real outliers, using the estimated sigma is more sensitive to outliers than the using some quantiles. OK, next thing. We should look at the fitted values and the residuals. Just make this a little bit larger. And then also looking at the residuals versus time, like this. And what we argued before was that there might be something for small values of t here. So let's go in and zoom in on the first 200 observations. Just make it so that you can see the whole thing. At first, it looks quite OK. But if we then add our fit in here, well, what happens here? We have the data here. And then we have a fit that does not look like something that should be just horizontal in here. If you look at all the data again, well, we could consider a different model. We could consider a second order polynomial. So we could just add a new model where we add this and the important thing is, if I just do time square, it will say it's the interaction between time and itself, which is just time. But to actually get time squared calculated, I put this i around it. 
to get the identity out of this. So this is one way of doing it, but we can also update the previous model. So this way of doing it is the same as saying, I have my previous model and I take that to be what it is plus the second order term. And you can see I get the same thing. Now, when I then look at the summary of this, the first thing to realize is that the first two coefficients here are no longer significant. So sometimes you can argue, are you allowed to remove an intercept and something that is part of something higher order? Well, when things are continuous, I generally say that it's fair, um, but you have to kind of pay attention to what you're actually doing. So I will remove the least significant per, per term first, namely the intercept. And then I do the summary of the reduced model. I notice that the p-value for the slope is lower than before, but still not significant. So I will remove the slope as well. And then here is then the final model. And if you look at this, can you then guess what was actually used to simulate this data? A hint is to look there. That looks similar to something. And this value is also quite close to some number that you probably have guessed before. Just to say something. And now I only estimated one parameter. So our second estimate of sigma hat is this, just as we should get it. If we now plot the residuals from our model, it looks very well indeed. And do the same thing for the histogram. I should have made um, same number of fin as before. And you can see the density here again looks, there is some variation, but it looks generally fine. And actually I prefer to look at the empirical cumulative distribution function rather than histogram because that is easy to see if some probability mass has been moved from one side to the other, which is of more interest than this one being tall and the neighboring one being small. What we started out doing before was to make some predictions. We'll do it the easy way again, do the same prediction as before. 95% prediction interval. And here we will show the second order fit that we made first. And then I'll add lines with the predictions. And I will also add lines from the linear fit from before. So now when we look at making a legend as well, we have the quadratic fit and the linear fit in green. And well, when you look at the data, it's quite obvious that the red fit is nicer. But you can also see that there's a quite substantial overlap of the two prediction intervals. But the linear relationship does underestimate the progression. Uh, and in this case, it produces a similar level of, of uncertainty, as in the range is quite similar. So that was what I just wanted to show for now. So see you back in class on, on Friday. Bye bye.